guys a friend of each other. So, so I'll ski, I mean, I'll ski just about anything, but... So um, thank you, Bob, for putting me up as Sergeant of Arms so quickly. Thank you, Bob. I'd like to uh, invite um, our guests um, or any visiting Rotarians to stand up and introduce themselves, or Rotarians stand up and introduce their guests. Diane's uh, my friend Tom Giannakis. It's his second visit to our club. 
uh, and he has recently retired uh, from ESPN to be on an operations producer there. Welcome. Before you've probably seen him before. He might not have talked to him. He has a very interesting past, and you might know, find out more about him. And he will sit on him, so we got to get him signed up. All right, introduce your cast, Dr. Christina. Thank you, Bill. Y'all, this is Chuck Schrader joining us today. Like so many of us, he was invited by Jim Hebner, who is not here today. Pro <laughs> move. So, y'all, welcome, Chuck. I'm glad to have him here with us. Welcome, Chuck. So this is my husband, Brian, who is joining us, most of you know him. Happy day. Birthday. Oh, okay. Happy Today birthday. Happy birthday. Oh. Oh. Birthday, and I said, absolutely, come to oh. <laughs> And I know Jim is watching us on uh, video, so hey, Jim, uh, so you can't be with us. Um, I, you know, Bob, I know uh, you have some interesting stories that you can share with us later, but Bob and Becky Woodruff have come back to the United States after what was a six month trip to Vietnam or something like that, Bob. Um, so welcome back. And in the spirit of your return, I'm going to ask that we pass around the fine basket um, so that we can retrain Bob to use a fork and knife again. <laughs> Who has that? Sorry? Ah, and here it is. There we go. Um, and while that's going around, um, I just, you know, want to share a little uh, video with you. A year ago, this week, um, this is a true story, um, it was reported that a missing man accidentally joined his own search party for hours before realizing he was a person they were looking for. Has anybody heard this story? <laughs> true story, true story. Um, Bayan Mutlu had been out drinking with his friends when he wandered into a forest in the Bursa province of Turkey. When he failed to return, his wife and his friends alerted the local authorities, and a search party was formed and sent out. Mr. Mutlu, who was 50 years old at the time, then stumbled across the search party and decided to join them. And hours later, when members of the search party began calling out his name, he replied, I am here. <laughs> so I guess the moral of the story is you really can't find yourself until you're among friends and community. And with that in mind, I want to offer a special thank you to Linda Sanders for organizing the quarterly litter pickup last week. Um, it was a great opportunity for us newbies to really join the Rotarian community. And I'd like to ask Linda to start our, us off with the OP crowd. Linda? Uh, so if you all would please join me for today's blessing. We give thanks for the opportunity to be a Rotarian. Rotarians dig wells from which we will never drink. We vaccinate children we will never meet. We restore eyesight for those we will never see. We build housing we will never live in. We educate children we will never know. We plant trees we will never sit under. We feed hungry people regardless of their race or politics. We know real happiness, which as Albert Schweitzer once said, can only be found by helping others. For this opportunity, we give thanks. Yes, I agree. So it's November 4th. A couple interesting things happened uh, on this day in the past. I don't know if anybody knows this. In 1960, Walter Cronkite was born. Did you know that, Jim? Oh. 1960, Walter Cronkite was born. In 1939, 16. 16. No. 16. <laughs> <laughs> In 1939, the Chicago Auto Show introduced the first car with air conditioning. Remember that, Bob? 
1957, Sputnik was launched. In the spirit of this um, get up the vote week, in 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected president. In 2008, Barack Obama was elected. To shift gears a little bit, 2002, last month, this day, um, we lost a music icon, uh, Loretta Lynn, died on October 4th, 2022. 20, uh, Does anybody remember her debut single? I'm a honky tonk girl. Does anybody remember her most famous single? Yeah, Coal Miner's Daughter, correct. But what was the name of the best title of any of her songs? Anybody want to take a shot of that? Nope. Woman enough to take my man. All good, but I believe the, the answer to that question is, you're the reasons our kids are so ugly. <laughs> so, so in the spirit of that theme, I was thinking about um, other top can not love song titles that I could share with you, and you're all welcome to join in. But um, on that list, number 10 is, if the phone don't ring, you know it's me. <laughs> Going further down that list, how can I miss you if you won't go away? <laughs> I still miss you, baby, but my aim's getting better. <laughs> my wife ran off with my best friend, and I sure do miss him. <laughs> If I had shot you when I wanted to, I'd be out by now. <laughs> if you don't believe I love you, just ask my wife. Ooh. I like the idea of you. I'm so miserable without you, it's like having you here. <laughs> I liked you better before I knew you so well. And number one, if I can't be your number one in your life, then number two on you. <laughs> All right, with that in mind, Omar, you got it. Thank you. Great job, Saul. That was wonderful. Um, how's everyone doing this Friday? Good. All right. Um, the tradition that has been started, we're looking at Birthdays. It looks like we have two birthdays uh, this week. One birthday today. Is Moyer here? Moyer's with you. What well, today is his birthday? He's about 85. About 85. 85. Impressive. And then on Sunday, uh, Lorenzo has a birthday. Lorenzo. Happy birthday, Lorenzo Moyer. Say again? Julie has a birthday on Sunday. She does. November 6th, I'm sorry, yeah. And uh, Julie has a birthday on Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. Happy birthday, Julie. Is uh, Russ here? Russ also has a birthday on Sunday. Happy birthday, all of you guys. Um, Lorenzo has a brief announcement you'd like to make. Thanks, Omar. Hi everyone, um, just a quick update on youth services in case you guys have people of this age in your families. Um, you know, we had, one is youth exchange, which means kids can go overseas either for a summer or for an entire year. It's just about anyone who's in high school age 15 to 18 and a half. We're having an info session November 16th. And if you contact me, they don't have to go to the info session, but we're holding one at the Chamber of Commerce uh, boardroom. Ryla, Ryla's a big one. Now, does anyone here have a, a kid who's a high school junior? Or have a, a grandson or a kid? All right, think about Ryla, let us know, please. Priority is given to children of club members. We have a limited number, it's a wonderful experience. And the kids that go to it say it's life changing. It really is awesome for them. And a nice thing on their resume as well. And then lastly, if you have seventh or eighth graders in your life or know them, we're having a four way test essay contest. Our club offers a first prize of 100 bucks and it's 75 and 50 for second and third. And then if they win first prize, they go to the district. And last year, the boy from Phillips won first place here and first place at district, and he made 
So keep that in mind. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, has everyone seen the uh, photo up on the screen? That's our own Rob Malin, and that's Rob uh, for Halloween. Rob's not only a lawyer, Rob also is now an actor. So Rob, is, this is true, this is, I mean, this is, this is real. Rob is uh, gonna be taking part in a, what is it, a Christmas? Christmas Carol. Christmas Carol. Yeah. Um, and they're gonna be performing in Raleigh and at Yeah. So I don't know how large his part is, but uh, we have a thought of getting together a group of Rotarians to go cheer him on. Maybe every time Rob comes on stage, we yell his name. Um, <laughs> Mike Clayton, did you have something you want to add? Well, I do actually know the part that they, I think they picked for Rob. If anybody's familiar with the Christmas Carol, you know, when Scrooge has his awakening and, and, and turns a new leaf, he goes out looking for the biggest turkey he can find. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that that's going to be Rob's part. That's <laughs> great. That's great. So we're going to be sending out some information. Uh, get in touch with DPAC. So if anyone is interested in going, we can make a night of it. Uh, maybe get a meal beforehand and go cheer Rob on for his acting debut. Um, we also have the holiday party coming up December 9th. Um, Evite should be coming out any day now. Uh, we have um, the party will be up at Still Life, uh, which is above Sutton. It used to be the former players of Purdy's. So um, it's going to be a little bit different this year. We hope to have a band and I hope everyone can make it. Um, does anyone else have any other announcements that they'd like to make? Chris Richards. So does everyone get Holy Grails with the uh, that's still hard or whatever? The, so the Players Club used to, you know, they had the, the Holy Grail, which is like nine different types of alcohol. <laughs> Apparently they were popular with the undergrads. So, so anyway, you were told. <laughs> allegedly, allegedly. All right, so um, tailgate 2.0. We checked the weather. There appears to be no hurricanes. <laughs> On the horizon, uh, we're, we're, we're uh, UNC playing Georgia Tech. UNC, by the way, is seven and one. Yeah. 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 Think we pushed the coastal, but we've seen crazier things happen. Um, hopefully, the weather's gonna be awesome. It should be a really, really fun game. So I'm gonna send around the, uh, the sign-up sheet. So this is a tailgate right next to the, the bell tower. Uh, it's a lot of fun. A lot of the band walks by, a ton of, ton of great scenery, so it's really, really great. $10 a person or $25 for a family if you've got a lot of kids like I do. Um, it's a little bit cheaper to do that. And I think Mike and I are cooking. We're going to have a little barbecue cook-off, so um, probably best to eat before you come. <laughs> no, we have no it's liability. It's tough. It's a tough group. It's a tough group. All right. Anyway, sign up sheet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, now I'd like for Bob Woodard to come up to introduce our speaker, please. Thank you. I wanted to uh, tell us all that uh, having him be in the sergeant line for the test, which he fought, and so it's been nice having him in the club. <laughs> uh, most of y'all know Jim Head. Uh, and uh, Jim provided me with a script, which he said, you know, stick with the script, don't go off the script. He said, but I know you won't. So anyway, I just want to introduce uh, a great, uh, a great sportscaster, Jim Lampley. Uh, he worked for CHL for a little while. Uh, Bob, Bob Holiday uh, hired him, and uh, Jim is taking full credit for Jim Lampley's <laughs> career. He said if it wasn't for him, he'd probably be working at Walmart. But anyway, read the read the bio, and it's very impressive. And so now here's Jim. Now. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, Rotary Club. The fact of the matter is, and I'm about to read you something that will begin by pointing out that. All of my broadcasting experience I owe to Jim Hebner and Bob Holliday. But the fact is that pretty early on in my WCHL and University of North Carolina 
football and basketball radio network experiences, there was a moment when Hebner pulled me aside in a bar somewhere or some other uh, dark circumstance and, and <laughs> said, very seriously, said, Lampley, you know, you're really good at all of this on air talking and stuff that gets attention in this business. But if you fall in love with being an announcer, a broadcaster, you have no idea how easily you can wind up carrying equipment in New Bern when you're 46 years old. Now, I had seen New Bern in a political campaign. 46 sounded like a thousand to me. Uh, so I was fairly receptive when Hebner went on to say, if you really want to achieve anything in the business you're in right now, sales is the way to go. And I know that you don't think sales sounds creative or fun, but the fact of the matter is that it really is. And he went into a spiel about how every competent salesperson is a uh, producer in his own right. And it was partially as the result of that conversation and the fact that I had seen Newburn uh, that I wound up in graduate school focusing on broadcast management and taking only the courses in the radio, television, motion pictures department that had something to do with broadcast management because Hebner had gotten to me. Uh, he, he had uh, convinced me that a, a career on the air was subject to all sorts of idiosyncrasies over which I would not have any particular control and that the safer path was to um, follow the revenue stream and focus on management or sales. And that was prior to the moment when a television network reached out and uh, changed my life. So it didn't go ultimately the way either Jim Hebner or I had viewed it. Um, and that's the nature of life to a certain degree. I know that you all have a brief bio uh, of Jim Lampley on the table. Hebner was very forthright in saying to me that he thinks the most interesting moments that have taken place in discussions here proceed from questions, you, and answers, presumably me. So on that basis, and aware as I am that you have all been given that brief biography that's on the table, I thought it might help us all to focus if I offered a little bit more of a roadmap to help you choose questions. Point one is that everything I ever experienced in broadcasting I owe to Hebner and Bob Holliday. They put me on the air, first at WUNC-TV and then at WCHL and the University of North Carolina Football and Basketball Radio Networks in the period 1971 to 74. I was doing a lot of other things simultaneous to that finishing up my absurdly schizophrenic undergraduate career, mostly D's and F's and the incompletes for the first year and a half, then mostly A's the last three years, working for more than a year in the Galifianakis for Senate campaign as the assistant campaign press secretary, a spectacular learning experience, 16 hours most days, no pay, but a lot of free Greek food, and I saw all 100 counties and their county seats. In fact, we used to kill time in that campaign while driving around the state getting ready to take uh, the congressman to personal appearances by competing with each other in the car, those of us who were young campaign troops, to see who could best remember all 100 counties and their county seats backward and forward, geographically and alphabetically. Uh, I don't think I could do that now, but there were some times at three o'clock in the morning in uh, Rowan County or someplace like that when I could do that along with other people uh, in the car. And um, it was a spectacular learning experience. Then two thirds of a year getting paid as the chief publicist for a professional theater company named Carolina Repertory Company, headquartered here in Chapel Hill. Salary basis, $8,500 per year. And I thought I was pretty affluent at that point. Then more than a year in the master's degree program in the UNC Department of Radio, Television, Motion Pictures. And it was from that platform that I was chosen out of a national talent hunt to be the first person ever to stand on the sidelines of college football games with a camera and the microphone. Now, 
There might be a couple people in the room who are young enough not to be able to remember ever watching a football game that did not have an announcer standing on the sidelines with a camera and a microphone. But prior to 1974, that had never happened. And the first two people to ever have that experience were me and a Stanford graduate named Don Tollison. Uh, and we were the two guinea pigs who had been chosen from a national talent hunt uh, by ABC Sports which was at that time far and away the number one network in sports. There wasn't any plausible argument about it. Uh, there were 432 candidates. I did not fit the original description that had been put forth, but so be it. I was flushed out of the process early on when the public message was that the chosen person would be a never before exposed raw rookie with no camera or microphone experience. Thanks to Holiday and Hefner, I didn't fit that description at all. I was reinserted three months later after I was first flushed out when executives realized that that raw recruit with no experience whatsoever was exactly the opposite of what they really wanted. So they sent me to do an audition interview to profile an athlete of whom they had no way of knowing that he was a boyhood hero of mine and that I still had his college jersey, his number 10 University of Miami jersey, in my closet. His name was George Myra. I went and did a spectacularly well-informed interview with George Meyer. At that moment in time, I probably knew more about George Myra than members of his family did, but nobody at ABC Sports knew that when they assigned me to what they thought was going to be this, you know, scratch and sniff interview with a subject that I had nothing um, in common with or knew nothing about. The first game was September 7, 1974 in Knoxville, Tennessee, Tennessee versus UCLA. And my career in network television remained continuous from that moment until December 2018, when the last of HBO's boxing telecasts took place and I said goodbye from ringside in Carson, California. I worked at ABC Sports for the first 13 years of my network career, during which time I moved early on from Chapel Hill to New York where I inherit, inherited my first New York apartment from the woman who had been homecoming queen here, Mary King, the year before my freshman year, no, the year of my freshman year, and her husband, a Duke scholar named Charlie Rose, who wanted to become a long-form interviewer. By 1987, when that network was sold, I had done everything you could possibly do from the World Series to the Super Bowl to inheriting the Monday Night Football halftime highlights from Howard Cosell, you can imagine how thankless a task that was, to the early career of boxer Mike Tyson, to the beginning foundations of the ultra-endurance sports culture. I was the first broadcaster ever to see and try to decipher what was a triathlon, what was a cross-country Pacific to Atlantic bicycle race. I did all of that kind of stuff before anybody else had ever uh, had the privilege or the, the task of trying to decipher those things. My five Olympics at ABC, just for those of you who are conjuring a question, were Innsbruck, Montreal, Lake Placid, Sarajevo, and Los Angeles. And in those five Olympics, I graduated from feature reporter to swimming host and play-by-play uh, -play, to late night studio anchor to political reporter the very first Olympic event I was ever sent to was Franz Klammer's downhill run in Innsbruck, which is, to this day, the greatest downhill skiing drama of all time. On the Lake Placid night of the Miracle on Ice, my legendary boss, Rune Arledge, sent me to the hockey arena at the last minute on a gut predilection that we just might need some kind of post-game interview and I would know whom to grab. Yes, it was Mikey Ruzioni. From ABC, I went to CBS Sports, then to CBS News, and anchor of the nightly news in Los Angeles, the Alberville Olympics, then added Wimbledon tennis, and dozens of prize fights every year on HBO. By the middle 90s, I had left CBS Sports for NBC, where I hosted the NFL scoreboard, called NFL games, hosted golf, including the Ryder Cup, the US Open, anchored late night and eventually daytime at the Olympics. In order, at NBC, Barcelona, Atlanta, Sydney, Salt Lake City, Athens, Torino, and Beijing. That's thousands of hours of programming on, on NBC. 
and I also hosted Nagano or Turner, but by far the largest number of hours were spent in service to HBO. And the best part of that is that I have yet to lead to a commercial on that network, and now I know I never will. We never sold soap. If there's a bottom line there, I would point to the obvious conclusion that through my rocky and uncertain tenure as a student here in Chapel Hill, I learned skills and instincts that served me well for the purpose of finding opportunities and proceeding through the labyrinths of network television, sports, and news. You could never have foreseen it. When I had dropped out, flunked out of UNC in the summer of 1969, and was proofreading loan documents in the First National Bank of Miami Mortgage Loan Department, very carefully seeing to it that the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed on FHA and VA packages of loan documents that sometimes stacked up <coughs> almost as high as from the floor to that podium. I worked in a room with four women between the ages of 62 and 65, um, no windows. Uh, and uh, and in 13 months, I boosted my salary from $350 a month to $425 a month. And when the senior vice president in charge of the mortgage department heard that I was thinking of coming back to school at Chapel Hill, he actually called me into his office and said, why in the world would you do that? You are doing so well in our filing department. You can have a great career here in the mortgage loan department of First National Bank of Miami. And I will honestly tell you that I looked across the desk at him. I had never met him. I looked across the desk at him and I thought to myself, oh my God, he thinks this is the best I can do. He thinks I need to spend the rest of my life worrying about whether I can make assistant cashier. And then maybe down the road, assistant vice president, and then maybe a chance to buy one of those FHA or VA houses, which now appear to me as stacks of impenetrable paper, uh, and continue to live in this steam bath that I hate because I'm desperate to get back to North Carolina. Fortunately, I came back. Fortunately, I decided to take a broadcasting course. Fortunately, I met Bob Holiday. Fortunately, he introduced me to Jim Heppner. <laughs> Fortunately, WCHL was a true business phenomenon at that time. In 1974 and 75, when I was there, if you wanted to say, okay, what is the essence of life in Chapel Hill? The essence of life in Chapel Hill was 1360 AM. Whatever you heard on the air from that organization on that day was what was going on in Chapel Hill, and I became a part of that. I never ever dreamed that that could be the jumping off point to go to a 46 year career in network television, but it was. Life is strange. Um, and um, all, all of this happened because while I was sitting in that bank, I knew that I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I didn't come back to Chapel Hill and at least try to find a way to stick around, try to find a way to deal with life in Chapel Hill other than to go to the shack at 1 p.m. every day and stay there until past midnight. Um, and after all, everyone comes back, don't we? Don't we all come back eventually uh, to this place? And now I'm back for good. And my wife, Deborah, right there with the mask on, and I live directly across the street from a corporal place at uh, 213 East Franklin Street. And uh, we believe that our apartment is the closest in proximity of any residence in Orange County to the place where the university began. And I, I feel really feel like I'm back for good. And I teach a course in the communication department, uh, Communication 490, Evolution of Storytelling in American Electronic News Media. And, um, and here I am. I've been living in, living out a somewhat overwrought movie script for 56 years too late to stop now. So again, Hebner, who as you all know is a skilled producer, advised me that he thought the most entertaining option here would be questions and the answers. Yep. And having told you all that, I can only hope that there's some curiosity in the room. <laughs> Fire away. When people ask a question, repeat it for everyone to hear. Okay, I saw a hand there. Uh, first of all, enjoyed uh, you know watching you for all these years. Thank you. Uh, 
so the 432 applicants, I'm assuming every one of them was a man. Uh, what do you think of the sidelines today where none of them are men? Well, first of all, um, you're wrong about the 432 being all men. Uh, I, I did not see all of the 16 conference rooms in which people gathered for that original screening interview. I only saw the conference room that I was in at the Parliament House Hotel in uh, Birmingham, Alabama that day in May in uh, 1974. Uh, and of the 36 of us who were in the room that day um, to be put through what was billed as a six to eight minute screening interview on the road to finding the quote, face and voice of the American college student. Um, there were probably 10 or 12 uh, young women in there. So there, there were no shortage of um, young women who were in the process and considered for the, uh, the original uh, position. Now, of course, what was billed was that there would be such a screening process every year and that whoever got the job there in 1974 was going to do it one time and only one time and there would be a new person every year. And by midway through the first season, uh, we'd already buried that, or they had buried that, meaning the network uh, uh, producers and executives had buried it because they wound up choosing two of us instead of one. Uh, and uh, the other one was a male, a guy named Don Tolleson from Stanford, who wound up going immediately after the football season directly to a very powerful local station, WPVI-TV in Philadelphia. And I was invited to stay at the network and continue forward with the network. And I wound up being the sideline guy for two more years after the first year. And during those two years, just from what I heard and observed and knowing the producer of the telecast who had a great deal of individual power over college football telecast, it became abundantly clear to me that as soon as I relinquished it, as soon as I was done with it, the sideline role was going to be a vehicle for putting a pretty girl on the telecast. And, uh, and that, you know, that was um, inescapable from Scuttlebutt and what I heard. So my initial successor was uh, a woman from, I believe, Baltimore named Ann Simon. And Ann Simon wound up being on the sideline for, I don't know, maybe half to two thirds of uh, a season in 1977. And then the next one after that was a former defensive end for the Maryland Terrapins whose name was Tim Brandt. Uh, and Tim Brandt was on the sidelines for a year or two and wound up moving on to play-by-play. Uh, -play. He was very competent and uh, uh, in some ways successful sports broadcaster. And then by that point, the beachhead had been established and uh, and on we went to, you know, any number of different sideline reporters and eventually they were added to NFL telecasts, not just the college telecast. And um, there was actually, I mean, this goes on and on. There was an uprising during the first season uh, and the uprising was actually fueled by the sports writers. And the, the sports writers got together with the sports information directors who had a, an association called COSIDA and they wanted to push the coaches to get rid of me, to get rid of me and Don Tolleson, because the sports writers argued, these guys are stealing our sidebar stories. Those things that we have brought to college football and helped college football to thrive with by reporting on Sundays, when, you know, when we've gone to the locker room and done follow-up and asked questions and gotten the sidebar stories, they're killing us. So, we need to get rid of these guys and nip this in the bud. And midway through the first season, they got the College Sports Information Directors of America, COSIDA, to go to the Coaches Association because the coaches really had the authority to rule what happened between the 30 yard lines. And if the coaches had all bonded together through the vehicle of the Coaches Association and said, forget it, we're not gonna allow the camera or the microphone or the reporter anywhere inside the 30s anymore, that may have been the death knell. But um, on the advice of Chuck Howard, the producer of college football, and without any reason or understanding of why he told me to do it, I had already 
flown to uh, Tuscaloosa on a Tuesday morning to have breakfast with Bear Bryant at seven o'clock in the morning in his office. And I had gone to Austin, Texas and had Mexican breakfast with uh, Daryl Royal at a, uh, a restaurant called Cisco's Bakery. And eventually it became clear to me that that had happened because Bryant was the president of the Coaches Association and Royal was the incoming president next year of the Coaches Association. So through those two breakfasts, I had killed the sports writers through COSIDA uh, initiative to try to get rid of me without even realizing that that was what I was doing. When it came up in a coaches association meeting, Bryant kind of wrinkled his brow and said, oh, I really like the kid. What about you, Daryl? Well, I like him too. And that was the end of that. Uh, and that's why to this day, you still see a sideline reporter with a camera and a microphone in every uh, pro and college uh, football telecast. Yes. I remember that hockey game in 74. You remember what? The hockey game, Russia and the U.S. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. Like where, last where you interviewed uh, Aruzioni. But that's a long time ago. And could you just refresh us on how important that game was and who Mike Aruzioni was? So, <laughs> so um, Lake Placid takes place at an extremely politically fraught moment. Uh, the, the United States is under threat in various different ways, diplomatically and politically, uh, around the world. Um, Russian tanks have rolled into the streets of Kabul in Afghanistan, and the United States is trying to find ways to push back and uh, get the Russians out of Afghanistan, and it's not working uh, because uh, the Soviet uh, machinery is uh, is intense about what it is they're going to do and everybody knows that the united states is not going to send troops into afghanistan <laughs> to try to push the russians out of afghanistan so um one of the first subjects that comes up is do we ban the russians from coming to the olympic games on our turf in lake Placid? uh and uh, at that time russians were overwhelmingly important to competition Figure skating, obviously, uh, cross-country skiing, uh, and not to mention that the Soviet hockey team is demonstrably the best hockey team in the world. They had won five games out of a seven-game exhibition series against a National Hockey League All-Star team in Canada the year before. And they had not lost any international competition of any consequence, including Olympics and World Championships for 16 years. So there was no way that the Russians were going to be forced out of coming to Lake Placid. Um, and, and even more to the point, there was no way that if a ragtag bunch of uh, college players and semi-pros and underage types uh, who populated the United States hockey team had to play Russia at some point in the competition that they would have any chance whatsoever. In fact, five days before the opening ceremony in Lake Placid, the uh, American team played the Russians in an exhibition game in Madison Square Garden. The Russians won that game 10 to three, which is a giant route in a hockey game, as you know. And uh, many, many American sports writers and commentators commented afterward if they had wanted to make it 30 to three, they could have. They went easy uh, on uh, the Americans. So now, uh, and by the way, sidebar, what was my assignment at Lake Placid? Politics. I was the on-site newsman working for both uh, ABC Sports and ABC News and covering uh, political discussions, including the primary one at that moment, would the United States mount an effort within the International Olympic Committee to move, delay, or cancel the summer games in Moscow later that summer? There were meetings at Lake Placid. Cyrus Vance, the Secretary of State, flew in. I met him at the Lake Placid airport to interview him as soon as he got off the plane, talking about the subject of whether the United States was going to attempt to force the cancellation or the delay or a venue move uh, out of Moscow later that summer. And um, nobody thought much of anything about it when the United States begins the hockey competition with a couple of wins over 
Germany and uh, uh, Romania. And then in the third game, um, they, uh, they beat the Czechs. Now the Czechs were the second best team in the world. So now the United States has beaten three teams, including the Czechs, and if they can win one more game, they will be in a what amounts to a, uh, a medal round semifinal on Friday uh, of the second week against the Russians, against the, the, the powerful Soviet team. With the greatest goalie in the world, Vladislav Tretiak, uh, in goal. And, uh, and the United States won the next game and they, they go forward toward the, uh, the Friday night game. And now, um, ABC, recognizing a giant ratings attraction that no one had anticipated, goes to the uh, Olympic authorities, the, the governing bodies that run the uh, Olympics, including the Hockey Federation, and says, hey, this game is scheduled for 5 p.m. Eastern time. We're not even on the air at 5 p.m. Eastern time. That is between our afternoon segment and our evening segment. So you've put us in a position now where the United States is gonna play the Soviet Union in the most important <laughs> hockey game of this competition, and we're not even on the air. Move the game to 8 p.m. Well, of course, the Russians, uh-uh. The game is scheduled at five. It's been scheduled at five for months. We're playing at five. Uh, and consequently, there were millions of Americans who were alive at that time obviously fewer every day, 1980s a while back, but there are millions of Americans who believe they saw that game live on television, and they did not see it live. They saw a tape delay, all right? And I was in an edit bay uh, putting together a compendium piece of all of the political stories that I had covered, interviews with Cyrus Vance and stuff of that nature, and I'm sitting with a producer and a tape editor in a cramped edit bay, and as we're editing our feature piece, we are watching the beginning of the US versus Soviet Union hockey game on a monitor about, about that big uh, above uh, a tape machine uh, in amid our machinery. And um, it, as the first period is winding down, uh, Russia leads two to one. The United States has gotten a slap shot goal from a kid named Buzzy Schneider, who was Herb Brooks's captain at the University of Minnesota. And now, as the seconds are ticking away at the end of the first period, there's a loose goal uh, in the Russian end of the ice, and two Russian players are chasing, or excuse me, a loose puck. Two Russian players are chasing that puck, and, and chasing between them is a tiny American player named Mark Johnson, who for two weeks was the hottest goal scorer in the world. There was no logic to how many goals Mark Johnson scored in Lake Placid, but one of them was the goal that he scored, tapping that ball in under Vladislav Tretiak's mitt to tie it at 2-2 at the end of the first period. It was the first time that I ever watched officials in any sport go to a monitor at the side of the ice to look at the monitor to see if the, 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 the puck had actually entered the net prior to the expiration of the period. They watched, they saw, they said, yes, it's a goal, and we're tied 2-2 after uh, one period. Within 20 seconds after the ruling that that goal was good, the phone rang in my edit bed. And I had been taught from the first week of working at ABC Sports that every facility, every remote truck, every office, Every um, edit facility, et cetera, et cetera, had a red phone. And the red phone was called the Rune phone. If a red phone rang, that was the boss, the president of the division, the all-powerful, most important sports television executive in the world, Rune Arledge. And uh, it could not be anybody other than Rune Arledge because only Rune Arledge could initiate a red phone call. So within seconds after the score becomes 2-2, the red phone rings. And now the producer and the editor both kind of look around and they look at me and they say, you, you're the senior person here, you have to answer that call. And I pick up the phone and I hear Rune's voice. It's unmistakable and he says, where's Jim Lampley? I said, Rune, it's me. He said, what are you doing? And I described to him what I was doing. And he said, drop that, leave it. I want you to go to the hockey arena. I just have lunch. Rune was known for what was called the golden gut. The golden <laughs> gut was this Indescribable ability to understand when something was going to happen. 
And so his golden gut was telling him, this is one of those moments. And he says to me, leave that, leave it behind, dump what you're doing, go to the, uh, the hockey arena. If something happens, we're going to need, we have eight minutes formatted for Jim McKay in the studio after the end of the hockey game, if all goes according to time. And if something happens, we need an interview to fill those eight minutes. And now you have to be the person to go and set up that interview and, and get to it. Uh, because we're gonna be showing the game on tape. It's not live, we're gonna be showing the game on tape and that'll be the way that we go off prime time. And the last thing I said to him was, Room, I don't have the right credential to get into the hockey arena. Now that doesn't sound like a big uh, problem, except that you have to remember that the massacre of 11 Israeli athletes at Munich had taken place just eight years before. So proper security and the proper credential to get into an Olympic venue was still an extremely ticklish subject. And I said to him, I don't, I don't have a credential for the hockey arena. And he said, you'll get in, well, uh, and that was the end of the call. So I left and I walked through the snow and I got to the hockey arena and the first person I ran into was the high school Lake Placid hockey coach who was the venue manager for the venue and stunningly, amazingly, I had met him. I had met him purely by accident two or three days before. And he saw my face and he waved me in. So now I'm in and now I have to find a place to watch the game. And I wind up on a camera platform 40 feet behind the place where Al Michaels and Ken Dryden are calling the game. Um, and, uh, and there's another story that goes with that involving a folk singer named Harry Chapin who had done a concert at the Olympic Village the night before and he too is on the camera platform and, and we too often are either jumping up and down or making some kind of a ruckus and the cameramen are turning around and yelling at us, stop that, you're ruining our shot, this is the basic coverage camera, etc., etc. At any rate, long story short, um, Ruzioni scores the goal. United States wins the game. I go down to the uh, the uh, area where players come out of the dressing room after the game. I managed to get to one side of that entryway. The players are all coming out of the uh, sweaty locker room and going to the other side. It's chaos. I'm yelling and screaming, yelling and screaming, trying to get a player to come to me. Couldn't get anybody's attention. The last person who came out was Mike Ruzio. We had the same agent, okay? His, his agent had been a National Hockey League agent, became a broadcasting agent. He was my agent. Later he would be Al Michaels' agent. But at any rate, the bottom line is, because we had the same agent, I had met Arruzion about uh, two weeks before and he recognized my voice amid all of that chaos. And I wound up going to dinner with Ruzioni and Jimmy Cray, uh, the goalie, who stood on his head in that game like no, no goalie has ever stood on his head. And I had dinner with Craig and Ruzioni and Jimmy's parents. And then we stood in the main street of Lake Placid outside the little Italian restaurant where we ate. And thousands of people gathered behind us to be in the shot as I got the throw from McKay and did the live interview with Iruzioni and Craig uh, on the subject of, uh, of what had happened there. And um, the, the bottom line for that story is that over the years at uh, Olympic gatherings and memory events, I have run into both Iruzioni and Craig several times. And every time I'll turn to Iruzioni at some point and say, you know, um, through the vehicle of videotape, Mike, you are now the leading goal scorer in the history of hockey. And Mike always says, Lamps keeps going in, doesn't it? <laughs> and that's a lesson in life. <laughs> On videotape, it keeps going in. Always does, yes. Huge boxing fan, loved you on HBO. Thank you. Your favorite fight, which one you call Favorite it? fight. Um, you know, there are a thousand of them. But uh, interestingly, you know, you would think that the favorite fight would be between two fighters of enormous importance in all history, et cetera, et cetera. You would think it might be uh, Mike Tyson's upset loss to Buster Douglas in Tokyo. Uh, you, 
second fight between Tommy Hearns and Ray Leonard. You know, there, there are any number of choices. Um, if you're a real boxing fan, it's the first fight between Arturo Gatti and Vicky Ward. And, uh, and I think that um, that's because in terms of the courage of boxing, the soulfulness of boxing, and the thing that I taught my wife about, which is that it's a sport about love. Um, it's a sport about, uh, in a certain odd way, it's a sport about romance. And when two fighters literally seem to be trying to kill each other with every punch and, and take each other all the way to the limit of death, the way those two fighters did, and the bell rings at the end of the 12th round and they fall into each other's arms, what I've taught Deborah over the years, and she understands now very well, is that moment is pure love. At that moment, those two fighters know more about each other than anybody in the world. Maybe their mothers, but probably not even their mothers. In a fight like that, there are only two people in the world who know who won, if anybody won. And, it, and in, in Gaddy and Ward, it's very, very difficult to say that either won because both of them proved their combat courage and their ability to withstand punishment beyond any uh, logical measure. Um, and, you know, uh, to this day, uh, if you put Tommy and Ray together, uh, if you put Evander and Mike together, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Arturo Gatti's dead now, but Mickey spoke at his funeral, Mickey gave his induction speech at the International Boxing Hall of Fame. The uniqueness of boxing is the element of love. And that's what I have most loved about covering it over the years. Yes, sir. Um, I'd like your unbiased opinion of the uh, retirement of Jim Smith and Roy Williams compared to Coach Day. Jim Smith and Roy Williams compared to <laughs> well, I, uh, you know, um, nothing could have been more of a misjudgment than the 96 players with the 96 Nike D jackets and the whole pre prescribed uh, post game celebration thing, which became a bad Saturday night live skit. And, <laughs> and Krzyzewski compounded the error, totally compounded the error, by sitting there and saying to that assembled audience, um, this was, what was the? What was unacceptable. Unacceptable. Right, unacceptable. Unacceptable. Do you suppose before the national semifinal game that Hubert Davis might have used the word unacceptable at some point in, uh, in the locker room prior to that game? Krzyzewski dug his own grave uh, with everything he did. Coach Smith would never have done anything like that. We all know how utterly self-deprecating and how resistant to uh, glorification and uh, that kind of thing Coach Smith was. And Roy learned a lot from Coach Smith. And uh, let's face it, our culture's better. That's all. <laughs> So, kind of back to boxing, and with hindsight, and we were speaking earlier, what is, um, what, what were your, your initial thoughts and opinions on the 19-year-old Mike Tyson? So, um, first of all, I'll set this up by saying, I was assigned to boxing at ABC Sports by an incoming new chief executive of the sports division who wanted to get rid of me, okay? And he thought that, Signing me to boxing would be a great way to get rid of me because I was obviously an Eastern crappy white kid who wouldn't have any affinity for the sport and uh, boxing would be allergic to me and I would be allergic to boxing and this would be a way to get me to walk on my contract. He could never have known that uh, the very first sports event my mother ever sat me down to watch on a little television set in Hendersonville, North Carolina was Sugar Ray Robinson versus Bo Bowles and their second fight in uh, 1955 that I had been groomed and trained to be a boxing fan all my life, that my boyhood hero, far and away, because of a variety of reasons, nobody could ever have touched what Cassius Clay slash Muhammad Ali was to me, that the very first live prize fight I ever attended, February 25, 1964, Miami Beach, 
uh, Muhammad Ali versus Sonny Liston to uh, win the heavyweight championship, etc., etc., etc. All these things meant a great deal to me. I went to uh, when when the incoming executive at ABC Sports in 1987, Dennis Swanson, was seeking to get rid of me by assigning me to boxing. I said nothing about any of this. My agent said nothing uh, about uh, any of this, and uh, I went up to. Um, upstate New York to do my first fight, which incidentally involved a journeyman North Carolina fighter named Jesse Ferguson, fighting against a 19-year-old heavyweight prospect whom we had signed to a developmental type look-see contract whose name was Mike Tyson. And I knew very little about Mike Tyson. The expert commentator was a total boxing aficionado. He had seen Mike and the amateurs. We drove up in his Jaguar from New York to uh, Albany. He told me all about him, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, and Mike was overwhelmingly impressive, obviously, at that moment in time. In the fourth round, uh, Mike landed an uppercut that literally exploded Jesse's nose. I mean, he detonated his nose, and there was blood all over the ring. Uh, it was spectacular and theatrical. On the following round, the, uh, the referee stopped the fight. In the post-fight interview, my expert commentator, uh, who was doing his first show on television, Alex Wallow, went into the ring. He asked Mike a question about the uppercut that had exploded Jesse's nose, and Mike said, Captain him out of taught me that the purpose of the uppercut is to drive the opponent's nose bone into his brain. I was trying to drive his nose bone into his brain. And I thought to myself, oh my God, he's not going to be just the greatest quote machine in boxing. He's going to be the greatest quote machine in sports. Look what they had given to me. So, you know, I, I was not at ABC more than another year or so after that. And as soon as Mike went to HBO, my agent called HBO and said, Jim's tired of leading to commercials. Uh, can he come too? And I signed a contract with HBO and I owe Mike to this day for having uh, taken me to that. Now fast forward to Tokyo, February 10, 1990. And um, everybody knows if you follow boxing styles, make fights. Buster Douglas was, in a lot of ways, the exact prototype of what you would have wanted to blunt Mike Tyson. He was longer, he was taller, he threw his right hand straight over the top where the five foot nine, five foot 10 inch Tyson couldn't really see it coming. It was a one-sided fight from the beginning. And of course, remember, the very first live prize fight I ever went to was Muhammad Ali versus uh, Sonny Liston. By about round, round nine or 10, of Tyson Douglas, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, oh my God, the first fight I ever attended was the biggest upset in the history of boxing. And I am now calling the fight, which will be its successor as the biggest upset in the history of boxing. So just like coming to Chapel Hill was destiny for me and remained when I came back, um, there are certain moments in your life when you say to yourself, I was supposed to be here. I was meant to be here. And that, from a broadcasting standpoint, is the moment that I was meant to be there. Nobody else in the world would have had exactly the same qualification for calling that fight that I am. Um, so that's that uh, Mike and I are good friends. Uh, and uh, every time I, I see him, he will lean over to me at some point and say, you know, that. That person that I was when we were first together, that whole baddest man on the planet deal, and I always say, I know Mike, that's not you. He's sweet, he's easily influenced, uh, he is not what the public thought he was. At the moment. Heard, yeah. Yes. We have about three more minutes now. Um, I know I've taken too long. No, no, no. no. We're, we're yeah, loving it. We're loving it. And if, you, if you'd like to continue, I'm sure probably 95% of people would love to, to sit here and, and hear more. But you have your schedule. I imagine my wife has something to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Deborah, we'll get you there. Where do you need to go? <laughs> you know where so, I'd rather be. No, this, this, this is wonderful. The um, question I have for you is we all love hearing your stories. I mean, they're fascinating. And maybe you've already done this, um, and I'm just not aware of it. But you have you done, um, you know, much in terms of uh, 
with your curating all this? Yeah, curating all this and, and letting people hear it and adding visuals to it. You know, I, I let a lot of time go by. I mean, I, I didn't do it in the middle of my career. I was busy. Uh, I have children, I have grandchildren, I have a wife. Uh, I was building out a course that I could teach. Uh, you all know who Art Chansky is, right? Everybody knows Art Chansky. So I've known Art Chansky for 50 plus years. And uh, as soon as I came back to Chapel Hill, Art said, we should do a book. We should do an as told to book. We should do the whole Jim Lampley story. So he has it, it's in his hands. Uh, we are attempting to publish, uh, in uh, interestingly, um, when George Foreman, at age 45, became the oldest heavyweight champion ever, knocking out 26-year-old unbeaten Southpaw heavyweight champion Michael Moore in 1994. Um, that was, in some ways, the most challenging moment of my broadcast career because George had been my expert commentator at HBO for quite a long while. I knew him extremely well. I had spent several months saying to George, how in the world are you going to beat Moore? And Holyfield couldn't find him, and Holyfield has much better feet than Dudu. He's a mover, he's a southpaw. I just don't see how this is gonna happen. And George said to me, over and over, you watch. At some moment, late in the fight, Michael will come and stand in front of me and let me knock him out. If you go look, go look at the video sometime. It's uncanny. Moore comes and stands in front of him in the 10th round and lets George knock him out. And, uh, and, and so when it happened, I'm, I'm looking at it and thinking, oh my God. How in the world did that take place? When I told George over and over that it couldn't happen. And now I'm also thinking, why didn't I stay up last night and think of something to say? You know, why do I not have something like, do you believe in miracles? They're all prepared and, and written for this moment. I don't. And what came out of my mouth spontaneously was, it happened. It happened. And what I was referring to was what George had told me. That it would happen, and it happened. So the title of the book is, It Happened, <laughs> if it happens. Uh, and, and, and so far, no publisher has made it happen. But yeah, I'm hoping that we will do something like that. Thank you, everybody. Jim, this is a token of our appreciation. Um, we have one of our members who raises <laughs> funds for education and nutrition in Zambia, and uh, this is one of the pieces of artwork they make, so uh, carry that with you, and thank you for your time. I know we all enjoyed it. That was spectacular. Yes. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. I said, all right. All right. Well, let's go ahead and have a good one.